How's it going everybody? So today I wanted to show you guys how to make this. Now, hopefully I'm showing you some sort of sweet cinematic something or other uh, of the project I'm going to be building. I'm going to be building a dice tray, but this can really kind of be anything you want it to be. Now, one of the most common comments I get on this channel is people are kind of upset sometimes when I use all of my expensive tools to make all of the projects that I do. But I wanted to show you in this project that you do not need the expensive tools. The expensive tools just make it easier and more brainless. I don't have to think through all of my measurements all the time because I could just do repeated cuts and that sort of solves a lot of the problems. Uh, but if you're willing to do a little bit of measuring and a little bit of work, you can make any project that I make on this channel with limited tools. I make sure not to make anything that's too complicated that you can't do with simple hand tools. And so today, I'm gonna to be showing you how to make this project with limited tools as well as show you how I'm probably going to make most of it with my machine tools just because I don't wanna be here all day chopping grooves. You can do today's project with nothing but a chisel and a handsaw and I guess a clamp and a measuring device of some kind, something that measures angles. That's all you really need and you can do this entire project at home, even in your kitchen if you wanted to. So step one is we are going to head down to the home center. I'm gonna be going to Menards, most likely, and I'm going to be getting uh, some sort of one by three, probably a dark material, probably gonna be looking for something like a mahogany, somewhere around three feet long should be plenty for this project. And then I'm also gonna get a wider board that is going to be about the width of my final piece so I can cut it down. I'm gonna be making it into an octagon. Then when I get all those materials, I will come back here and I will meet back up with you. <sighs> Menard sucks, I went to Home Depot. All right, so this is what I ended up picking out for the sides of the dice tray. This is a piece of poplar. I love this stuff. It looks kind of green when you first buy it, but over the first year or so, it will darken up considerably. I'll show you a picture of some poplar that is completely, almost completely untreated. It only has a little bit of oil in it and it's completely darkened over time. That's why I like this stuff. Uh, you can stain it, but I would suggest you hitting it with an oil. I'll show you all that later. The important bit that we have to focus on right now, because this is going to be the edges of our dice tray, um, we are gonna have to figure out what angle to cut this at. So basically the way you find this is you take 135 degrees, which is the angle of an octagon, and subtract that from 180, which gives you 45, and you cut that number in half so that you have an even miter on both sides, and that gives us 22 and a half degrees. If you don't follow any of that, that's fine. If you're gonna make an octagon, you cut your pieces at 22 and a half degrees, and there's many different ways of finding this. You can use one of these speed squares. I'm probably gonna do most of my cuts over there on the miter saw, but just to show you how to do this, you just take this, Pivot it on this angle and you can find your 22 and a half degrees, okay? Now, if you're gonna be cutting this by hand, you're also going to want to follow this line around right there, because this is the line we're going to be following on the back end, there. Now, there is no question as to where you are supposed to cut. So you're gonna cut all this waste material off. You wanna leave a little bit of room for your saw kerf as well. So let's go over here and cut this. Okay, now I'm gonna bring this over to my vise because I have one. Uh, if you have a clamp, that will work too. A vise will make a world of difference though. And so, basically all you do is you cut your line very carefully. If you get this miter a little bit off, you're gonna end up with gaps. So we go ahead and get our mark centered, make a little bit of a cut there. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna follow this line straight down, very gently. We're not gonna pull either direction, we're just gonna follow it straight down. And then we're gonna come up here, cut this, and then we're gonna cut down. We're just gonna keep alternating back and forth. And then when we get to the end. There we go. And then you're just gonna do that again. You're gonna mark your line. And you basically just keep doing that over and over again. Now one of the things that you can do is after you cut this next piece, you can cut a triangle out of this. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna mean that you can match your grain on the outside all the way across. Normally what I do is I just cut this and then I will come back, I'll cut it like this and like this and I'll just flip one of the pieces. That works well enough for me, but if you wanna do the waterfall thing and you just cut out little wedges like this, this piece will be completely scrap material. But then of course your grains are gonna match on the outside. You can do that if you want, but it's completely up to however you wanna do it. What I'm doing right here is I'm cutting all of the left sides of my edge pieces so that I can turn the saw to the other side and cut all of the right sides. This just keeps me from having to turn the saw on every cut. The cool thing about this process is I don't have to adjust my stop block because my miter saw automatically pivots on its center. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I did it! Okay, now that we have all of our pieces, we're gonna have to identify 
the top and the bottom of each one. And on the bottom, what we're gonna be doing is we just take our board and line it up with the very bottom of the piece and we're going to draw a line, okay? And then, somewhere around the halfway point, you can cut a, a shim here if you want to. I'm just gonna use my finger because I know I can do it accurately. And we're just gonna draw a line here. You can use a clamp for this as well, but I'm gonna be using my vise. There we go, nice and solid. And of course, there is a number of different ways of doing this. I am going to be using my table saw here in a little bit to cut the majority of these. But the way you do this, if you're just starting out, just start chopping with a chisel. You don't want to be right on your line. You want to be maybe uh, an eighth of an inch in front of it. And we're just going to chop. Because if you are a little bit off on any of these chops, it's going to show up on, on your main piece. Once you cut this underside, you can go ahead and chop it on the top and it should split right across. We're going to do that one more time and then I think we should be able to clean it up. Okay, ready? Okay, so that is our groove cut. And so you can see, if you look closely, so our line is up here, we haven't quite reached it yet, and this line down here, we haven't quite reached that yet. That's why all this uh, shattering of the board needs to happen inside uh, all of your good material. And so now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna chop straight along the line, uh, just barely below the line on each side, and we're gonna clean this up so that we have a nice, nice rabbit right on the side of our piece. This part might seem a little funny. We'll take some things to take. I don't really know how much we're going to need, so we're going to wing it is what we're going to do. So there are specially designed band clamps that you can use, but if you don't have those, you can just do what I do, which is I just use painter's tape, and it actually works really well. In any place that you don't have clamps, especially for gluing, painter's tape works pretty well. So when you're gluing these, you have to remember that the outside, if you get glue on the outside of your pieces, it's fine. That can be sanded off pretty easily. The hard spot to fix is going to be the inside corner here. So that's where you have to make sure you don't get any glue. Oh, just like that, right? Exactly. Don't, don't do that. Dang nabbit. Paintbrush works really well for this. Also, these clean up pretty well because this glue is water soluble. You want to make sure these press together so that there's just a tad bit of squeeze out. Okay. Okay, so as I said, glue is water soluble, so if you're really careful, kind of wash all this stuff off. One of the best things you can keep in your shop are baby wipes. This comes from being a dad for several years. Uh, I ended up with a couple of these in my shop and I found these actually work fantastic for this to get all this glue off. If you have any glue seep into the grain of your wood, um, it will not accept any stains or oils or anything like that. So you wanna get that glue off as fast as you can. Try not to have it on there at all if you can manage it, but that's a bit unrealistic bag has probably lasted me more than a year. 
So we can come back in about an hour or two to do the next step if you can be really gentle with your piece. But because I'm a bit of a brute and I have a tendency to uh, break things, uh, I'm gonna come back in about three hours and this should be uh, sealed pretty well. All right, I'll be back in three hours. So when I cut these pieces over on the table saw, I cut it so that they were half of the width of the piece. And the reason I did that is because I wanted a little bit of room to play. There's a lot of extra space here. So as long as I'm within a quarter of an inch, I'll still make this work. I'm still gonna try and get this piece as accurate as I can, but we have to cut this piece into an octagon. And I know a lot of you are gonna be working with uh, hand tools. So I decided to just give myself a little bit extra room to play. So this piece is gonna sit right here on top. And so I have the ridge on the bottom. And I like, I really like this dark line right here. So I'm gonna include that. And so I'm gonna line this piece up on the side and I'm gonna line this piece up on this side. As long as that doesn't move. That piece, that piece, and that piece. Okay, let's see how that looks. Looks pretty good. I think I may have slipped right there, but if that's too thick, I can sand that down. So let's go ahead and take this over to the other side of the bench and we can cut out this octagon. Okay, so normally whenever you're making a cut like this, you're gonna wanna cut on the waist side of your material, but because these are all glue joints, I'm not gonna worry about that too much. I'm just gonna be cutting directly on the line because that's going to give me a little bit of slop in my rabbits. And whenever you have slop in a glue joint, it actually makes your piece stronger in the long run as long as it's not a visible joint. And because these are gonna be on the bottom, I'm not really too concerned. So I'm gonna be cutting directly on the line. There we go. Now, that actually will work really well. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut the rest of these and then we'll see if it fits. All right, so I got my piece all cut. I did have to do a couple bits of sanding to get some of these lines in plane. And uh, so I put a mark, a little witness mark down here on the bottom that I'm gonna sand off a little bit later uh, so that this ends up sitting uh, exactly where I need it. So all I'm gonna do, you put a little bit of glue in here. Yes, glue, now come on over here. And we can take this we paint this on. We, can put it, we want to put it exactly where we want it because we want to try not to get any glue on the inside ridge because that is so difficult to sand later. I'm going to try and avoid that as much as possible. Daddy, what? Put you want to hammer inside? Yeah. You can't have my hammer inside. Why? Because that's my hammer. You can't take my hammer inside. So it's a really good idea to try and put your glue just right here because as I push the piece of oak down, it's going to have a little bit of squeeze out in the bottom. And I am going to clean it up pretty well, but I can't guarantee it's going to be perfect, so. Now if we look on the inside, there was a tiny bit of glue there. Oh, that's actually not, okay, that actually wasn't glue. I actually didn't end up with any glue on the inside. There's no squeeze out, which is actually perfect. So all of our glue is gonna be right inside these crevices here. So we're gonna wait until this dries. We're gonna wait about two hours and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna sand all this down. If you ever wanna see what your finish is gonna look like on it, you can wet this down and see what your grain actually looks like except that with the poplar, that's gonna get darker over the first year or two. Beautiful. All right, so we're finally ready to start sanding this. We are not gonna have to sand any of the inside because of how good we did with the glue. But yeah, and there we go, there's all our tops. There's the bottom. We're gonna sand this a little bit just to make it feel nice, but we're basically done, so. Obviously, if you don't have the sander, you'll just have to do this by hand. It's always a good idea to go and do a once-over really quick by hand either way. But if you don't have a sander, one of the things that you can do, 
I'm gonna put a link in the description to a large number of belts you can buy off of Amazon. Uh, these are just a random assortment of different grits of belts, and I think they go all the way up to, I think like a 200 or a 250 or something. But basically all I ever do is I take those belts and I just put them on a block of wood, like this, and then when you sand it, you can basically do everything I just did with the machine. It takes about twice as long, but it does work in the long run. This is just about done here. So you can finish this however you want. Lots of people like using things like polyurethane. I feel like that makes the wood look too plasticky. I'm not a big fan of that. I like kind of a natural look of wood. So if you want a good surface that you can, I don't know, maybe spill water on or something without hurting it, um, go get something like a shellac. I usually use a bullseye seal coat for that. Um, but what I'm gonna be using today, because I really like the natural look of wood, is I'm going to be using boiled linseed oil. I love this stuff, this is fantastic. Uh, and it will give you a much more natural look to the wood. And it all depends on what you want it to look like. Because, like I said, I'm working with poplar. I almost never put any kind of real seal coat on the poplar because I like it when the poplar darkens. The poplar is gonna end up being darker than this oak here, so. So it actually isn't gonna hurt it too bad to have a little bit of pooling of the oil. It's just going to penetrate deeper into the wood. That's all it's gonna do. And then the oil is actually going to seal up all those grains. Oh, that's so pretty. Look at that. So you don't even have to worry about your brush strokes or anything with this stuff. This is why I like it. You just throw it on there. It doesn't matter how thick. You just leave it on there and it's good. You really can't screw it up too bad except for, you know, missing a spot or something. So I'm gonna come back in about an hour or two and this should basically be done. We'll get some, uh, and we'll get some finishing shots. This is gonna be a good one. That smells. Hey, thank you all for watching. This was an absolutely fun project. I would highly recommend if anyone is just getting into woodworking and needs something like this, or if you know anyone who does need one of these, this is a fantastic beginner's project. It's really not that difficult and it kind of gets you introduced to working with angles that aren't simply 90. 90 degree angle projects are generally gonna be a lot easier for you. So these edge pieces ended up being about four and a quarter uh, on the long side and that works perfectly for a board that is under 10 inches long. And that's even accounting for the fact that most 10 inch boards aren't actually 10 inches wide. So if you buy a 10 inch board, uh, four and a quarter length actually works really well for that. Uh, you'll have to do math if you're gonna build it any other size. And that actually reminds me, this is a project I've done before on this channel. I think it was about six years ago, uh, was actually was like my fourth or fifth video that I have on this channel. I actually built almost this exact same dice tray. It was a little bit different and had different plans. My plan was to make this one different, but I was looking at the old dice tray and I realized, look, this actually was poplar last time too. I did not remember what I made this out of, but I was looking at it and that's poplar. So you can see how, how dark or how green this color here is and how dark and more mahogany look this is. And then the white stuff kind of turns out to look more like, uh, like a maple or something like that. Actually, I looked up the video. Look, there's the video from, from six years ago that I have on this channel. And this is made out of the exact same wood and you can see how much it changes over time. This is why I like this. Uh, if I decided to hit this with more oil and clean it up really well, it would look so beautiful. I might actually do that before I bring it inside. And then of course the inside is actually a cherry, but that's kind of what you can expect from the poplar. So anyway, thank you all for watching. Hit the thumbs up if you like this video. Let me know if you follow along with this project. I'd love to see what you guys make. But either way, thank you all for watching. I'll catch you all next time.